Today we're going to talk about hair embryology, hair anatomy, and hair physiology as it relates to the hair growth cycle. We're going to briefly sort of go f through each of these components so you have a better understanding of some basic science in regard to hair anatomy and cycling. As far as the embryology, let's just briefly cover this so you understand sort of how a hair grows during fetal development. Around the 10th week of gestation, the primitive dermis or mesenchyme has the the primitive signals that originate from the dermis and go upward toward the epidermis and the, that stimulates the creation of epidermal plaque codes. These plaque codes are where the hair follicles will develop. Then what happens is these plaque codes then come back and stimulate the mesenchyme or primitive dermis to create a, conden, uh, a dermal condensate and this dermal condensate then stimulates the creation of a f longer segment called the uh, follicular peg, which is almost the full length of a hair shaft or hair follicle, and then that eventually matures into the bulbous peg, which has the shape of a mature follicle. So essentially, in summary, there's this ongoing interaction between the dermis and the epidermis to create the signal signaling that will generate a mature follicle. So I think that's all we need to know about embryology. Let's talk about basic hair anatomy. The way to think about hair anatomy is dividing it both uh, horizontally going outward as well as vertically going upward. Let's talk about perhaps a vertical orientation. So taking a hair follicle and transecting it upward, what are the various regions? There's two major regions. The bottom portion, which goes from the bulb up to the isthmus, the central part of the, the, uh, the hair follicle, and then from isthmus up to infundibulum. And the bottom portion is the non-permanent area where the hair is undergoing cycling through each hair cycle will degenerate and come back. And the upper portion, the isthmus and infundibulum, is a portion that tends to uh, stay permanently throughout the hair cycle without change. So uh, let's break those vertical components further down. So we take the bottom portion, the non-permanent part, and we can subdivide that into the bulb and then the superbulbar region. And those areas are the, where the hair is actually dividing and growing through the matrix cells that sit in the bulb region of the hair that generate and create the hair shaft, the uh, inner root sheath, and the outer root sheath, which we're going to talk about for the horizontal dimensions. In the permanent part of the of the hair follicle. It extends basically from the, what's called the bulge region. And we're going to talk about what the significance of the bulge region is more in a moment. That's, first of all, where the erector pili muscle uh, inserts. And from that portion, the bulge region, that includes the isthmus and infundibulum, this is the area that, if you look at the isthmus, that extends from the bulge up to where the sebaceous gland inserts. And then the sebaceous gland entry up to the skin surface level is known as the infundibulum going outward, which is really just lined by normal skin. The bulge area is significant because that has now been found to be an area where there are stem cells that help regenerate the uh, hair follicle. And the bottom portion we talked about in the embryology, the dermal condensate, that becomes the mature dermal papilla. And the dermal papilla, which is an invagination of the dermis, causes growth of the, the uh, hair follicle. And what the thought is, these two areas, the bulge and the dermal papilla, work together. The, the uh, dermal papilla is thought of the, as the inducer of hair growth and in terms of the hair length and the hair caliber. And that interacts with the bulge region in terms of, they think of it as a, as a responder. So they work in, as a team to grow that follicle upwards. The hair can also d be divided anatomically going from inner to outer. It's like concentric circles that work out. It basically is the hair shaft, the inner root sheath, the outer root sheath, and, and a connective tissue sheath that goes around that. So those are the, the look at the, the hair shaft going outward. The, the, small, the inner portion, which is the hair shaft itself, is then subdivided into the med med medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle. The medulla is not always present in the terminal hairs, the thicker terminal hairs, um, and there, it's absent in the small vellus hairs. We're going to talk about the distinction between those two in a moment. The cuticle are, is like shingles of a roof. They actually uh, aim upward and they interlock with the cuticle of the inner root sheath so that there's a scaffolding and a, and a strength to the hair as the hair goes upward. The inner root sheath is then subdivided into what we just talked about, the inner cuticle that's interlocking with the hair shaft cuticle. And they grow up in unison as, as the hair shaft grows. 
the Huxley's layer, which is a few layers thick, and then Henley's layer, which is one layer thick. And those have a keratin hyaline type of keratin hyaline type of uh, granules that cause the keratinization, which is different from the type of keratinization that occurs on the skin surface. But that keratin is so important because it creates rigidity. The best way to think of the inner root sheath is it's like a scaffold through which the hair shaft can grow and maintain its caliber going up. And there are differences in the uh, cuticle of the inner root sheath between the different races. The inner root sheath continues to go up and really dissipates about the level of the uh, ismus layer, where from the ismus, ismus layer going up toward the um, uh, going up toward the sebaceous gland, there is no more uh, scaffolding or inner root sheath scaffolding. It becomes the outer root sheath scaffolding, which then turns into the epidermis. And the outer root sheath, as the final part we're going to talk about, is, is basically goes all the way from the, uh, the bulb region and extends all the way out. And as I said, it goes up and changes into the, um, into the surface epidermis. At the region of the isthmus, the area that we just talked about where there's no um, inner root sheath to be had, the outer root sheath is the thickest there, and it's the thinnest toward the bottom at the, at the bulb region. Let's talk about the differences between a terminal hair and a vellus hair. In general, our body has about 5 million hairs, and it's all over our entire body except for palms, uh, palms of the hands, soles of the feet, uh, genitalia, a portion of the genitalia, and uh, those are the areas that uh, tend not, and the lips uh, don't have, uh, have any hair on them. But basically, all that hair is vellus, tiny little hairs, compared to the thicker terminal hairs. And at puberty, the, the thinner vellus hairs uh, change into terminal hairs in certain sec uh, secondary sexual characteristic areas, such as the pubic region and the axillary areas. So what's the difference between a vellus hair and a terminal hair? What's, a, what's, a, what's the significance? Well, let's compare those two and have you understand a terminal hair is what you see in a normal scalp. It's a thicker, dark hair that has a long shaft that continues to grow very, very long. And the vellus hairs are very, very thin. The thickness of a terminal hair is about uh, 70 microns versus about 30 microns for a vellus hair. And the, the terminal hair can grow feet long, whereas the uh, vellus hair tends to grow about one or two centimeters long and anatomically has a very, very thin uh, outer root sheath compared to the thick outer root sheath for the terminal hairs. And the clinical significance of vellus and terminal hairs is you, you can have vellus hairs go into terminal hairs, as we talked about it during puberty. It's also a condition that can occur uh, in people that are born with a lot of terminal hairs, uh, such as in the uh, syndromes of hypertrichosis. But usually, that's more the uh, lanugo hairs of birth uh, becoming more terminal hairs. And then what's more important than all of that is the, uh, the change from the thick terminal hairs into vellus hairs, a process known as miniaturization, which is one of the principal hallmarks of androgenetic alopecia or male pattern baldness. So we always think when we think about male pattern baldness, obviously you just lose all your hair. It's actually, yes, you, you do have a shorter antigen phase where you're, you're, you're starting to lose, you lose your hair, but you're also, the hairs are, are being converted to these baby vellus hairs before they're, before they're gone through a process of miniaturization. So that's, a dis that's an important element of thinking about terminal versus vellus hairs. The next thing I want to talk about is hair cycling, how the hair grows uh, during a growth cycle. As we talked about in summary, the lower portion of the hair follicle is a non-permanent area where there's going to be a cycling component. So what are the cycles? There's three major components of the hair cycle. There's antigen. There's catagen and there's telogen. And antigen phase is the time when the hair is growing rapidly. In fact, it's one of the most rapidly growing uh, areas of the body. If you think about people that have, ha that have chemotherapy, they lose all their hair because they get what's called an antigen effluvium where the hairs are, are, are broken due to, the, due to the impact of the drugs. So the antigen is a very, very highly uh, growth phase um, due to the matrix cells in the bulb, er bulb, bulb area that's growing the, the hairs out. Um, so the antigen phase also just briefly can be subdivided into six stages. Uh, some people put a seventh stage on there, where essentially the first couple stages, the, uh, after the hair has already been shed, the uh, dermal papilla is starting to elongate again. And then it starts to descend in, the, in three through four. And then five through six, is the hair shaft is emerging. And so antigen is that growth phase. And 
let's break down how long these cycles last. The antigen is, in most people, it lasts about between two to four years, so it's a, a long time of growth. The catagen phase, where the hair is beginning to, 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 um, to retract and being prepared for expulsion, lasts a shorter time, between about two to four weeks. And then for the telogen phase, where the hair is going, undergoing expulsion, that phase is lasting about two to four months. We usually say about three months. So if you break down the percentages, is generally speaking in most people about 90%, 1%, and like 9 or 10% in terms of 90% antigen, 1% in catagen phase, and then you know whatever the remainder, 9, 9% or so 10% in, in telogen. But that can be changed with telogen effluvium, with, uh, with androgenic alopecia or male pattern baldness. Those, there can be shifts, for example, in male pattern baldness. You could have an 80% antigen phase and 20% telogen due to uh, a shortening of the antigen phase. So uh, those are the sort of the, the hair cycles. It, the hair cycles are also asynchronous. So we're not, all, not all the antigens are growing at one time, all the telogens. Otherwise, you can have all this massive hair shedding, which can occur, obviously, in uh, telogen effluvium or other conditions that, uh, that are presented in other videos and other parts of this website. The uh, next, after the antigen growth phase, the catagen phase is during the time where you see the, the, uh, the hair shaft beginning ready to, for expulsion. It begins to, in the non-permanent portion, begins to retract upward from the dermal papilla and starts to create this club-like hair that is with, with loss of, of color to the, to the hair ready for expulsion. And then in telogen phase, that hair is actually ex expelled and th when the hair is actually gone, it's known as an exogen phase. So those are sort of some ideas about how hair is cycling through in our, uh, our hair. The reason that's important is that when we start discussing some of the clinical conditions of hair shedding and telogen effluvium and antigen effluvium and all those things that have pertinence to the hair cycle, we have to principally understand what the hair cycle is all about. So hopefully that short video on hair embryology, hair anatomy, and hair physiology in terms of hair cycling was helpful for you um, just to get a basic understanding of the basic science of, of all these components.